Well, good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing on this Labor Day weekend? Come on now, you gotta be better than that. You doing all right on this Labor Day weekend? That's better, that's better. It is great to be at church with you today on Labor Day weekend. Thank you for anybody that's watching online. Thank you for being here at church with us as well. Uh, I'm excited for the opportunity to preach and to share with you today. And, and I do, I believe I have a word for you that the Lord is going to use to, to challenge us, to encourage us. And so like, I want to encourage you just to lean in today and lean in and just be open to what God may want to share with you, speak into your life, speak over your life as we take a look uh, at this particular passage of scripture. And with that being said, I want to invite you to turn at this time to, to join me in the book of Mark chapter six, verses 45 through 56. Uh, I know that's a lot of scripture, but, uh, we don't mind reading the Bible around here. So that's what we're going to do today is just read a little bit of the Bible. And, uh, if you were here at revival this past Wednesday night, this story might seem familiar to you. And that's because on Wednesday night, Pastor Mo was here and he, he preached from Matthew chapter 14, which is a different account of the same story that we're looking at today. It's, it's, like, it's like we planned it that way, just to kind of give you a little bit of a one-two on, uh, on this particular story. But uh, we, we didn't actually plan that, but it looks like the Lord has that in store. So we, we're just believing that God's going to use this to, to challenge us and, and to inspire us and to, and to change us today. And so with that being said, let's begin reading together. Mark chapter 6, verses 45 through 56, this is what the Bible says. It says, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. And after leaving them, he went up on the mountainside to pray. And later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. And he, said to the, and he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. And shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost and they cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. And immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I. I love Jesus in moments like this. He's so funny to me. So the, the new King James version actually says that Jesus shouted out, be of good cheer. And if I'm in the boat, I'm yelling back, why? Man, the balmy winds coming on me, waves crashing on, boats about to be torn apart. I got no reason to be cheerful right now, Jesus. I love Jesus in moments like this. But he said, sigh, don't be afraid. And then he climbed in the boat with them and the wind died down and they were completely amazed. And skip down to verse 53, it says that when they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. And as soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout that whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces and they begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak and all who touched it were healed. Would you join me now in praying and ask God to bless the reading of his word? Heavenly Father, God, we love you so much and we're thankful for your word today. And Father, in these moments, would you allow what we read to become more than just words on a page? Father, would you use them to transform our minds and transform our hearts and our lives so that we can, so that we can know you in a better way, so that we can love you and serve you in a better way? And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. I want to ask you a question. Let me, let, me, let me ask you this. How many of you have ever, ever been on a road trip? You've taken a road trip. Yeah, most of us, I would say most of us in the room have taken road trips before. I, with summer not having been that long ago, we're probably fresh off a couple of road trips. Uh, if you're watching online, you may be on a road trip right now. And when it comes to road trips, our road trips, they may not all have a lot in common in terms of what we drive on a road trip or where we're going, our destination. But I do know there is one thing that every road trip has in common, especially if you're in the room today and you are a parent and you have children that are in the back seat of your car on this road trip. And the one thing we have in common about road trips is that about 45 minutes into this road trip, you will hear from the back seat from your children, Dad, are we there yet? You know, and, I, and for the most part, I answer this question, you know, pretty, pretty calmly. You know, no, we're not there yet. 
We'll be there in a little while. But there are times when I ask that question, when they ask that question, I, I, I just sit in the front seat and I just silently, I look straight ahead. It's just because I'm praying. I'm praying, God, like why are my children so annoying? They've asked this question three times. They've gotten the same answer. And, and, and if we're being really honest, many of us, we would love to respond with a little bit of aggression. And there are times where I, they ask me this question and I really just want to respond like, what do you mean are we there yet? What do, you, what do you mean are we there yet? If we were there yet, we'd be there. Does it look like we have arrived at the place where we are going? What do you mean? Like you have taken this trip with us a number of times. You know it's a four-hour trip. We're 45 minutes into it. What do you mean are we there yet? How about if we were there yet? When we, when we are there, I will drag your behind out the car. That's when we're there. So frustrating. But you know what I've learned about my kids over the years when they ask this question, Dad, are we there yet? They're not really wondering if we are in fact there. They know we're not there. They've made the trip. They know how long it takes. They know we're not there yet. The reason they ask this question is, is, is something like this. It's, Dad, we're 45 minutes into this trip and I'm bored. We're 45 minutes into this trip and I'm already looking for something exciting to do. Dad, I was excited before the trip because I was looking forward to where we were going and I'll be excited whenever we get there because I love the beach, I love the mountains, wherever we're going. But right now we're in the middle of this road trip and I am I'm run out of things to do. I played all the games on my iPad. In fact, Dad, my iPad battery is dead because I didn't charge it last night like you asked me to. And, and then, so now that's dead. And so I've been counting all the cows. I played I Spy with my little eyes more times than I care to admit. Dad, you know what, Dad? We need to better coordinate me being done with what I'm doing and you getting us to where we're going so we don't have this issue. Dad, are we there yet? Have you ever asked God that question? God, are we there yet? Because God, I know you, you said you have a purpose and you said you have a plan. I mean, I know we're going somewhere and along the way, I'm doing all the things that, that I know how to do. I've done all the things that I know how to do. I'm at church on Labor Day weekend. Come on, somebody. I, I was a part of 21 days of prayer. I came to revival. Revival was amazing. I was inspired. I was filled with faith for all the things you want to do in my life. And, and it was amazing. And now I'm ready for the next amazing moment. But I, I can't wait for it to get here. But it hasn't come along yet. God, I feel like it should have come along yet. Why hasn't it come along yet? And I'm in between this moment and this moment. And I just feel like I'm right here in the middle. And, and so, God, what, what do I do when I'm no longer where I was? But I'm, but I'm not yet where I'm going. What do I, God, what do I do in, in the meantime? And you know the disciples felt this. When you take a look at this story we just read, you know the disciples are in the middle of the lake, straining and struggling against wind and waves, and they are wishing that they were either back where they were before Jesus sent them away, or they're wishing that they're already through the storm and on the other side of the lake. And whenever you take a look at what had taken place in Scripture prior to Jesus sending them away, you, you would understand why they feel this way. And that's because right before Jesus sent them away, they had just witnessed Jesus performing an absolutely mind-blowing miracle. They had just witnessed Jesus take two fish and five loaves of bread. He blessed it. He broke it. He multiplied it. And he, performed, and he fed over 5,000 people. It was absolutely amazing. And I mean, I, and everybody who was there, who witnessed it, who experienced it, you know they were in disbelief at what they had just seen. I mean, I can almost see the amazement on people's faces. I, I can almost hear the disciples, you know, just huddled up around one another, standing along the lake shore, just asking themselves, did, did, did you just see what he did? Did, did, you just, did you just see what Jesus did? How in the world did Jesus do that? You see, it's because moments like that, they, they inspire us. Moments like that excite us, they encourage us. Moments like that leave us anticipating the next amazing thing that we might see. We've all experienced it. I mean, maybe for you here today, you, maybe, maybe it was the launch of your new business. Or, or, or maybe, it, maybe it was your wedding day. Or the day whenever you brought your newborn baby home from the hospital. Or maybe 
It was when you graduated high school or when you graduated college or when you started that new job. We've, we've already talked about it today. We, we've been in a season here at Stevens Creek Church like that for so many people. 21 days of prayer and revival. Amazing moments that inspire faith. And I love 21 days of prayer. 21 days of prayer is actually my favorite season that we have here at Stevens Creek Church every year. Uh, I mean, if I'm being honest, part of that is because it was during 21 days of prayer that I was hired on staff at Stevens Creek Church. Well, well actually, if I'm being honest, I've actually been hired at Stevens Creek Church a couple of different times. And, and, and that's because in 2018, my family and I, we left Stevens Creek Church, you know, and we moved away for a while, but we came back in March of this year, so it's all good. It's all good. I was actually talking with Pastor Dave about this because Pastor Dave also knows what it's like to leave a couple of times and then come back a couple of times. And, and I told Pastor Dave that I was going to take his staff award. Last year, he got a staff award called the Boomerang Award. And it was, it's the award, it's the award given to the staff member who was most likely to leave and then come back. And so I said, man, that's my award this year. You can't take it from me. It's my, I'm taking it from you this year. It's my award. But, but, but moments like that, they inspire us and they excite us. They encourage us. They leave us anticipating the next amazing moment. But the moments that immediately follow, away from the miracle, away from the highlights, we, we don't really talk about those moments quite as much. We don't really talk about what happens in the meantime. And that's because the meantime doesn't make headlines for any reason, for anything, anywhere. There's nothing really all that exciting about the meantime. We're not really a meantime type of culture. We are more of a highlight-driven society. I know for me, the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I turn on ESPN and I watch SportsCenter so that I can catch what? The highlights. And then later on that day, somebody might ask me, did you watch the game last night? And, and sometimes even though I didn't watch the game, I will tell them that I watched the game because I watched the highlights and it felt like I watched the game. You know, like we, we, we love the highlights. I want to see the walk-off home run. I want to see the game-winning shot. I want to see the touchdown pass. I want to see the amazing catch. I want what's exciting. I couldn't care less about watching players get their ankles taped in the locker room before the game. I want what's exciting. And the struggle for so many of us is that when the excitement dies down, we don't know what to do. Except look back at the last exciting moment or look forward to the next exciting moment. We struggle with life in between the highlights. We struggle with life in the meantime. And Jesus knows this about us. Jesus knows our fascination with the spectacular. Jesus knows that we have this tendency to be drawn to the miracles and to the highlights so much so that they can become all that we focus on or all that we look to or look for. He understands this about us. Which is why in Mark chapter 6, verse 45, we see Jesus, right after this mind-blowing miracle, Jesus immediately sends the disciples away. It says he made them get in the boat and back away from the miracle. And I'm sure they wanted to stay in that moment. I'm sure they wanted to kind of hang out in and around the miracle. I, I was talking with Pastor Mo after Wednesday night's revival service, and we were talking about how everybody just seemed to kind of linger in and around the auditorium, and nobody ever really wanted to leave because we want to stay in that moment. But what Jesus needs the, the disciples to understand, what Jesus wants you and I to understand is that life away from the miracle, are oftentimes it's more valuable than the miracle itself. And if we overlook it or we devalue it, we're going to miss out on something amazing that God wants to do in our life. And so today, I want to highlight a couple of reasons as to why you and I need to pay attention, why you and I need to value life in between, life in the meantime. And the first reason that you and I need to value life in the meantime is because the meantime is where the majority of life is lived. The meantime is where the majority of your life takes place. I used to watch, there's a television show I used to watch. It doesn't come on anymore. I think it's on Netflix now. It, it followed, a, it followed a, a really well-known high school football team from Texas. Uh, Friday Night Lights. Anybody watch Friday Night Lights? You got, how big of fans are you? If I were to say clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. Come on. We got some real fans in the house. That's right. 
And here in the South, man, we love football. We love college football. We love high school football. So this phrase, Friday Night Lights, like we understand what that's all about. We understand what that's all about. I mean, all throughout this area on a Friday night, high school stadiums are lit up. Friday night, and the reason for that phrase, the reason that that phrase exists is because Friday night is the night where lights shine bright. I mean, lights are shining bright, stands are filled, we're overlooking everything that's going on in that football field with excitement, but how many of you know that Friday night does not represent the majority of the season? The majority of that season actually takes place on Monday through Thursday on that same field in the hot sun with nobody in the stands and no lights shining down on the players. That's the majority of the season. Monday through Thursday is the meantime. Friday night is the highlight. But if we overlook or devalue what takes place on Monday through Thursday, Friday night, the highlight could never exist. And you and I, we have to understand that our life is not made up of highlight moments. Highlight moments are the result of the life that you choose to live. Jesus tells us, Jesus tells us that that life is not this series of highlight after highlight or big moment after big moment. Life is this series of rise and grind. Life is get up, go to work, go to school, do your homework, pay bills, meet deadlines, go to rehearsal, come home, cook dinner, take a shower, go to bed, and then you get up the next morning and you do it all over again. That's the majority of your life. And if all you ever do is look to the last amazing moment that you encountered, if all you ever do is look for the next amazing moment, you are going to risk living life in such a way that it makes it difficult for the highlight moments to become a reality and for the miracles to be made possible. Matthew chapter 6, verse 34, Jesus says this, Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble on its own. You see, Jesus is drawing our attention to the moments that we have right now. Because if you and I fail to be present in the moment that we have right now, we may very well miss the moment that's needed to create the miracle that you desperately want to see in your life. We have to value life in between life in the meantime because it's where the majority of life takes place. And if you miss out on that, you miss life. Another reason, another reason is because the meantime is where faith is strengthened. Life in between the miracles, life in between the highlights, this is where your faith is made strong. Whenever you take a look at the disciples in verses 48 through 51, you see them in the middle of the lake, straining against wind and waves, struggling in the middle of the storm. Yet it's away from the miracle that Jesus uses this moment to strengthen their faith. Because it's really easy to have faith in the middle of a miracle. It's really easy to have faith when you are surrounded by thousands of other people who have just seen what you saw. It's easy to have faith in the middle of a miracle when you're surrounded by thousands of other people who have just experienced what you've experienced. But if that miracle was going to make a difference in the lives of the disciples, and if it was going to make a difference in the lives of other people that they would encounter their faith in that moment, it had to outlast the moment. You see, your faith, it can be founded in a moment, but it cannot be grounded in a moment because moments do not last. And so we see the disciples in the middle of this storm struggling against wind and waves, but the Bible says that in the middle of their storm, Jesus, from the mountaintop, looks down and sees them in the middle of their struggle. says he steps down from the mountain into their struggle and he brings calm to their chaos. And it was in this moment, I believe, that whenever they see the love and the compassion that Jesus has for them in this moment, something shifts in their heart in relationship to Jesus. You see, because it's in this moment, the disciples recognize that Jesus is love and compassion for them and not just for the crowd. Jesus didn't just perform miracles when the stage was big and the lights were bright. No, no, no. He saw them in the middle of their moment of personal need, stepped in, spoke peace, and brought calm. And in this moment, something shifts in their heart toward Jesus. If you you turn back a couple of chapters in Mark chapter 4, you'll actually find the disciples in another boat, in another storm. If I were them, I'd just avoid boats. 
But Jesus, we see Jesus speak to that storm and calm that storm as well. And their response in that moment, I love it. It wasn't, look at what he just did. Their response in that moment was, who is this man? You see, your faith in who Jesus is, it must outweigh your desire for what you want to see him do. It's faith. Your faith is strengthened. It's in those moments away from the miracle. Moments whenever you feel like Jesus is all you have, those are the moments where you learn that Jesus is all you need. Your faith will be strengthened whenever you don't just rely on the emotions that get stirred up in revival and in Sunday services like this. Faith is strengthened whenever you recognize that when this moment fades, the presence of God in your life does not. You see, we value life in the meantime because it's just where the majority of our life is spent. It's where our faith is made strong. And then lastly, we value life in the meantime because the meantime is where preparation for purpose takes place. It's in the middle of these seasons in between miracles where God prepares us for the work that he's called us to do. The disciples in, 50, in verses 53 through 56, we see that just because Jesus insisted that they back away from the miracle, it didn't mean he didn't have a great plan in store. It didn't mean that another miracle wasn't just around the corner. In fact, we see that whenever they reached the other side, they stepped into another miracle. The Bible says that they were swarmed with people from all over the countryside coming in desperate need of healing. And everyone who touched Jesus or even touched, just touched the hem of his robe, everyone was healed. There was another miracle on the side of the storm. There's another miracle on the other side of the lake. But had they never gone through the storm, had they never endured the struggle, had their faith not been grounded in who Jesus was, rather than what they wanted to see him do, they would not have been prepared for the purpose that God had initially intended for them to accomplish. You see, strength is always developed in struggle. You see, whenever you struggle, you're made strong. And when you're made strong, you're made ready. And when you are made ready, you are prepared. And for you and I today, the best preparation that you and I can make for tomorrow, it's found in what you do with today. And so we value life in the meantime. Because it's just where the majority of our life is spent. It's where our faith is made strong. It's where we're prepared for the purpose that God had called us to accomplish. It's where we're made ready. Earlier, I mentioned that that in 2018, uh, my family and I left Stevens Creek Church and we moved away. And, and many of you may know that story, many of you may not. But the reason for that is because during 21 days of prayer in 2018, my, my wife and I, we felt like God was stirring up some faith inside of our hearts for something new. And we didn't really know what that was. But, but through continued prayer and through conversations with Pastor Marty, and an opportunity for us to, to plant a church, to start a church, was, was presented to us. And so that's what we did. 2018, we, we packed up everything we had, and, and we, we moved from Augusta, Georgia, to Denver, Colorado. And we moved to Denver, and we were full of faith and Man, we had hope and we had vision and we had dreams for everything that God was going to do in our lives and through this church. And, and so we got to Denver and we, we went to work. We went to, I mean, and we worked hard. I mean, like connecting with people, meeting people, building friendships, building teams, marketing, uh, making plans, all the things. That, like Facebook banned us multiple times for all the friend requests we were sending out said you can't they thought we were like a bot or something nobody needs this many friends oh we're planting a church yeah we do I mean it was exciting and, and then the day the day of our first service came on our very first Sunday 206 people walked through our doors and six people gave their life to Jesus and then five weeks later we had our very first Easter service and 125 people are in the room and seven people give their life to Jesus on that day I mean, it was exciting. We, we baptized people. 
We, 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 were, we had several small groups that were meeting throughout the week. We were serving the community in, in several different ways. It was exciting. And then you fast forward a little bit and we're getting ready to have our, our very first, our one year anniversary service. We're getting ready to celebrate the one year anniversary of our church. And man, we're getting ready to baptize eight people on that day. It's exciting. We're looking forward to it. And the day of our one year anniversary, it gets here. It's finally here. We're excited. March 15th, 2020. And all of a sudden on, on that day, all, all, the, all the faith, all the vision, all the hope, all the dreams that we had had for what, what we thought God was going to do, it, all the momentum we'd been working to build, it, it all just kind of seemed to come to a, just come to a halt. And it was in those moments we did exactly what every other church did. We did what you did here. We we, we, we set up a production studio in our living room and we began to, to record services. We began to stream services every single week. And we worked hard to maintain connections with, 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 with people and, and, and relationships with everybody who attended our church. But, but then as weeks passed, it, it became very clear in Colorado and in Denver that, that hosting an in-person gathering wasn't going to be a reality for quite a long time. And then as weeks turned into months and after doing everything that we knew how to do, and after weeks of prayer and fasting and after seeking wise counsel from overseers and, and like Pastor Marty and other trusted leaders, we had to come to the very difficult decision to, to close the church. You know, and it was in those moments where I just remember looking back on everything that we had gone through, everything that led up to the launch of that church. I look back on launch day itself, and I remember the faith, and I remember the hope, and I remember the dreams. I remember the excitement. But those moments were gone. And who knows when another moment that would generate that type of excitement and that type of faith and that type of, that type of vision, those type of feelings, who knows when that would come along again, if it ever would. We found ourselves in this season. We, we're, we're not where we were. And, and God, we, at this point, we don't even know where we're going. And so, God, what do we do now? God, what, what do we do in, in the meantime? And we decided to move back home two years ago. And, and really the past two years have just been this, it's been this process of just, just kind of reflecting and remembering wading through all the emotions of everything we went through and, and we've, we've wrestled with, with feelings of, of disappointment, feeling like we failed, feeling like we made a mistake, feeling like we let so many people down, feeling like we disappointed so many people. We questioned ourselves. We doubted ourselves. We, we, we questioned our calling. We, we, we were wondering, God, is this it? Like, I mean, is, is ministry over for us? You know, but as we walked through all of that, it was also during that season that we began to experience some healing. And that's because in those moments, we... We leaned into Jesus like we had never leaned into Jesus before because it was in those moments we felt like Jesus was all that we had. Yet it was in those moments that Jesus reminded us that he is all we need. And our faith in who he is began to outweigh our desire for what we wanted him to do. And now, as I look back on the struggle, I can stand here today and I can say, I, I didn't see it then. 
But I can stand here today and I can tell you that I look back on that struggle with gratitude. I look back on that season and I'm thankful today. Because I can see now how God used it and how God is continuing to use it to prepare us for something even greater than what we thought he was going to do before. I don't know what it is, but I know I'm being prepared. I know I'm being made ready, and I cannot wait for the day that we get to understand and we get to see what that is. And I know that when that day comes, we'll be excited to step into it, and we will see another miracle. And then, earlier this year during 21 days of prayer, as, as God would have it, when Pastor Marty reached out about an opportunity for us to rejoin the staff here at Stevens Creek Church, we, man, we, we stepped back in, into the, in, and we were excited to come back to our home church. We were excited to, to step back into ministry here at our home church. We were extremely excited about it, looking forward to it, and and, and, and I can tell you today with all honesty that I know, that I know because of everything we went through over the past four years, everything that we endured, all the struggle, I can tell you today that I am a better version of myself than what I was when I left four years ago. And I can stand here today with confidence, church, and tell you that today I'm stronger than I was when I left four years ago. And church, I can tell you with confidence today that I am more prepared to, to, to lead, to pastor, to love, and to serve the heart and the vision of this church and its people and this city in a way that goes beyond anything I could have ever done prior had I never left and had I never gone through the struggle. I know that today, I know that today, we're being prepared for something amazing. And just like the disciples who endured the storm eventually made it through and came to the other side, I feel like in this season, we're coming to the other side. And we're being prepared for another miracle. We're being made ready. And for many of you here today, you're in the middle of a struggle as well. It might not have anything to do with ministry or planting a church, but you're in the middle of a struggle when it comes to your marriage. You're in the middle of a struggle when it comes to the relationship with your children or with your parents. You feel like there's no hope for restoration. Maybe you're in the middle of a struggle when it comes to your business and the decisions that you're wrestling with or when it comes to your finances, you don't know what to do. Or maybe you're in the middle of a struggle in and around what God's calling you to do. And I also know that for those of you that are in the middle of a struggle right now, I also know that you've thought about giving up. And that's because we did. We thought about giving up. We thought this was it. We thought this, we, got, we were done. We were, get, we were ready to throw in the towel, put our hands in the air, and just be done with it all. And so I know you're thinking about giving up. In fact, there's somebody here today, you're giving God one last shot. But you know, whenever I look at this story, about the disciples in the middle of this storm. It says they eventually reach the other side. And as I read this story, I can only discover one thing that the disciples did that got them from one side of the lake to the other side of the lake. I only see one thing that the disciples did that got them from one miracle to the next miracle. They stayed in the boat. They just stayed in the boat. That's it. And don't you dare tell me they didn't think about jumping ship. Wind coming against them, waves crashing on them, boat about to be torn apart, about to sink. You know they were looking for an opportunity to jump overboard. You know Peter was. Peter just looking for some water to walk on. But they stayed in the boat. They kept rowing and they kept straining and they kept struggling. And as they struggled, they were made strong. And as they were made strong, they were made ready. And as they were made ready, they were prepared to step into the purpose that God had called them to accomplish. They stayed in the boat. And for you here today, 
I want to encourage you. Stay in the boat. Don't give up. Don't give in. There's more inside of you than you think there is. Keep loving, keep praying, keep serving, keep parenting your children, husbands, keep loving your wives the way Christ loved the church. Stay in the boat, keep paying off your debt, even if it's just $10 a month, stay in the boat. Don't give up, don't give in. And know that as you do, you're being made strong, you're being made ready, and you're being prepared for the purpose that God is calling you to accomplish. Stay in the boat. Paul tells us, In Galatians chapter six, verse nine, he says, let's not get tired of doing what is good. Or at the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. At just the right time. And I know there's many of you, you're sitting here and you hear that and you're wondering, well, well, when is the right time? Well, I have something profound for you. The right time will be when the time is right. When you read about this storm in Mark chapter six, it says when they arrived. If you go back to Mark chapter four and you read about that storm, it says then they arrived. There's no definitive time frame that they, get, they give you for how long it took them to get from one side to the other. There's no definitive time frame for how long it took them to get from one miracle to the other miracle. It just says then and when. Well, when is then? It is when it is. Listen, church, I have no idea how long it's going to take you to get through this particular season that you're in. I don't know. I know you're no longer where you were, and I know know you're not yet where you're going, and you're in this season in between, life in the meantime. But today I want to encourage you, do not overlook this season. Do not devalue this season because it's in this season that God is drawing you close to himself. It's in this season that your faith is being made strong in who Jesus is beyond what you want him to do. It's in this season that you're being made strong and that you're being made ready and that you're being prepared. And what I know is that That he's prepared, that you'll never step into the purpose that God has called you to accomplish. You'll never get to where you're going if you, if you give up on where you currently are. Bible says, stay in the boat. Don't get tired of doing what's good because at just the right time, you reap a harvest of blessing if you don't give up. Amen. Amen. Can I pray for you? Would you join me in standing as we pray? Heavenly Father, we love you today. And God, we're grateful for the amazing things you do in our life. We're grateful for the miracles. We're grateful for the moments that inspire us and that excite us and stir up faith. But God, today, we want to say thank you for the moments that immediately follow We want to say thank you for the moments. We want to say thank you for life in between because it's in those moments that you're you're making us strong. It's in those moments that you're drawing us to yourself. It's in those moments that you're preparing us. So God, help us today to stay strong. Help us, Father, today to just stay in the boat, to keep rowing, to keep straining, to keep struggling, recognizing that we're being made strong and we're being made ready and at just the right time we will step into the purpose that you've called us to accomplish. We pray all of these things in the strong name of Jesus and everybody in the room said, amen, amen, amen. Well, everyone, thank you so much for being here today, for spending your Labor Day weekend with us here at church. We hope you've, hope it's challenged you, hope it's inspired you, and we hope you have an incredible day tomorrow not going to work. And I pray that you have a blessed week. And we look forward to seeing you again next Sunday right here at Stevens Creek Church. Take care, be blessed as you go.